now I'd like to introduce Julie, Deacon Julie Morton, who's come from the northeast French circuit, is that right? Well, not not east, yeah. Uh, and she's going to share her message with us today. Thank you, Julie. I feel like I come from the northeast of the country then for a moment. <laughs> not the people in northeast. Yeah, I'm, I'm from the northeast circuit, but I'm um, working as a pioneer deacon in the city centre. And so later on, I want to share with you about the work that I'll be doing there. So we begin our worship this morning with a prayer. Lord God, we just ask that you pour out your blessings and honours as we gather to worship you to praise your holy name. Amen. Amen. The Psalm, 9, Psalm 93 says, O Lord, you are king. Majesty and power are your royal robes. You put the world in place and it will never be moved. And so we join together in worship as we sing together our first hymn. Number 55, if you're using the book, Immortal, Invisible, God, only wise. Please stand if you're able. and sovereign God, great and wonderful, all-powerful, all-loving, all-good, all-forgiving. Once more we make time to worship you. We come to remind ourselves of all that you've done, your mighty acts across the years, your coming to our world in Christ. 
your transforming of countless lives won for him. We come to rejoice in all you are still doing. Your faithful love reaching out to all people everywhere. Your mercy offering new beginnings where before there was only despair. Your serving, serving purpose constantly being fulfilled. Almighty God, forgive us for losing the sense of all we once had. Forgive us for, for forgetting how great you are. Forgive us for bringing you down to our level, rather than rising up to reach yours. Forgive us the smallness of our vision, the feebleness of our worship, and the weakness of our faith. Enlarge our vision, deepen our faith, renew our trust, restore our sense of wonder before you. Teach us that you are a great God above all gods, Lord of the nations, sovereign over space and time. So may we offer to you our worship with glad and grateful hearts. In Jesus' name, Amen. We say together the Lord's Prayer. Please feel free to say it in whichever version or language you prefer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, and forgive us those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. Sometimes children bury things that they want to perhaps just keep safe. Or maybe hide it away from the parents. I don't know. But people bury things that are precious to them. So whether it's a pet, a fish, a rat, whatever it might be. Whether it's an item of, of jewellery or a little, a little something that a child thinks is really precious. But to anybody else appears to be rubbish. You know what I mean, don't you? But sometimes we have things that we think are really precious to children. And we bury them away to keep them safe in that place. And sometimes we can't always remember where they are, to be fair. If we ever, ever want to be reminded, sometimes we can't find them again if we've buried them. And I was thinking, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about sand and about how if you put something in sand, it disappears forever, doesn't it? Because it's so hard to find things on the beach, so that you've never lost anything on the beach. If you lose money or anything and it disappears under the sand, that's it, it's gone. But you know, I was thinking as well about Psalm 139 and about how it reminds us about how God knows us before we were even made in the secret place, before we were even formed in the womb. God loves us and how precious we are. And how, I just thought, how wonderful is that? I love that Psalm. It really means a lot to me. But how it knows us and is, is known us and sees what we're doing, knows every hair in our heads. And how absolutely fantastic is that? And I just think, sometimes we feel like, we don't feel like treasure, personally. We don't feel that we're anything special. And perhaps sometimes we feel a bit unloved. But I think when we look at this psalm, it just reminds us how precious and special we are, don't we, doesn't it? And we think about those animals that were buried that were our treasures. But you know, God, to God, we're even more of a treasure to him than anything that we can know of or possess. Because we're so special and we're so important. And most of all, you know, I think we're absolutely amazing. 
So now we're going to sing together our next hymn, which is number 15, if you're using the book, The Splendour of the King. And it says in there, it just says, it reminds us how great is our God. How absolutely amazing is this God of ours who loves us so much and who knows every single thing about us. Please stand. churches as such. And so I wanted to tell you a bit more about what I do. So um, I came to Nottingham in 2021 and um, to carry out this appointment and if you want to go to the next slide. And so you, you will know, I'm telling you, I know things that you will already know, so please forgive me uh, for repeating things. But I came because um, there was a sense in which the district felt that there needed to be something happening in the city centre. And uh, so a bit of the history around that is that there's been the decline in numbers at life at the centre on Lower Parliament Street. And uh, this meant that the church, when it was in lockdown, I believe, that the church closed. And so the building was sold and um, the district as say, had a vision for something new. So my appointment is actually funded from the sale of the building in the city centre, and my work is too. The next slide, please. So I just wanted to think for a moment about, well, why did the district think there should be something different? And that is, I don't need to tell you that the church in the last century 
um, perhaps a bit less than that, has changed dramatically. Society has changed, hasn't it? And um, there's no longer that obligation for people to, to believe in a particular type of faith or to believe in any faith. <coughs> At one time, people were expected to go to church. And when I, I used to go to a little chapel in a village called Shafton in Barnsley, South Yorkshire. And when I used to go, there used to be lots of young people, uh, children, young people, and there were, it was only a small chapel, half the size of this probably. And uh, it was full, pretty full on a Sunday morning. When I got to about 13, everybody, all my friends from, from school had left, and there was just me, and I said to my parents, I don't want to go anymore, and they made me go. I had to keep on going. So perhaps I ought to be thankful to them. To them. I wasn't at the time, but I, uh, they made me go. But I'm just really saying that I was the one, so I carried on going to that chapel until I eventually got married at 26. And uh, so, um, the, the world has changed. And in this village in Shafton, the chapel and the working men's club, they both had chapel, uh, chapel uh, trips every year. And everybody, including the chapel folk, went on the working men's club trips. And the working men's club folk went on the chapel trips. And, you know, they all knew one another. And it's a different place. And the world is different today, isn't it? And um, so... The feeling was that we needed to look at doing something brand new in the city centre, but not really knowing what that would look like. Next slide, please. So, um, for instance, all this 2021, I've been trying to um, think about what we might do in the city centre, working with a core team, a small core team, which includes Deacon, included Deacon Jenny Jones, until still does until she moves on. And, uh, and a few other people as well. And our existing vision is to provide a place of welcome for all, for all to support people with their well-being through activities and external provision, and to begin a community of faith. Now these things are all still relevant, but we originally thought that we would have a look for a shop front that we could lease in the city centre. And although we've seen one or two people, uh, so two places, uh, so far the landlords have said no to us. So we've started to do things in different places. And so we still think that welcome, well-being, and community are an important, important part of what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do, but the things that we're doing are not all in one place, as we originally thought we would end up doing. So next slide, please. So, where are we now? So, we um, said, said before, we're building a core team, we've got a core team of people who meet together regularly to plan, to pray, and to work through uh, what God might be saying about what we should be doing. We encourage people to uh, join together weekly to pray for this work, and we meet uh, every Tuesday on Zoom at half past eight to pray together. We provide hospitality and uh, regular updates, and we, let, we have a newsletter that we send out every month about the work that we're doing. And like I said before, we're working in different places in the city. At the moment, we do some work in Emmanuel House, the Centre for the Homeless, and also for Tiger Community, in Tiger community Enterprises, which is on Mr Gate, just down the road from Maps and Spencers. And we also have started a new faith community in the Revolution pub in Hockley, across from Broadway Cinema. Thank you. So just to tell you a bit more about this new, our new faith community in, in uh, Revolution pub, um, we've been looking around, David is my partner over there, and I have been looking around the city for some free space from which to begin this new Christian community. And uh, we had been in a few hotels, and we've been in pubs, and there'd be nothing suitable. We walked past this, this pub across from Broadway Cinema, and the door was locked, I could see it was locked, and there was somebody sitting in the window, and I said, oh, we'll come back. And David said, no, knock on the, knock on the door. And we knocked on the door, knocked on the door, and the lady who was the manager came to the door, and she, I said, we're looking for some, some free space from which to start this new faith, a new faith community, and she said, it's funny you just say that because we're going to offer this side of the pub free to the community. And so we went in to have a look and uh, while it's not absolutely perfect, it was felt just right for what we wanted. 
And so they put a, a screen across, curtains across it. It's like having a curtains across that bit there. And uh, so it separates us from the rest of the pub. And we use the projector and they give us free refreshments every week. And how wonderful is that? And so we're only small at the moment, <coughs> but it's space for everyone. It's very laid back and relaxed. And it's very much about learning about one another as much as anything else. But we're hoping that from this springboard will be that we start to meet on another day to go further, to dig deeper with what we talk about every week. And as I say, it's 12.30 to 1.15, so it's only a short time together. Because we wanted it to be accessible for people who are working in the city, who um, are just shopping, um, or perhaps living in the city, but it would be a short time. So we weren't there sort of for you know an hour, an hour and a half, enough. But people know that they can stay a bit longer if they just want to chat, and they often do, to be honest. Thank you very much. So at Tiger, we uh, run a few months. We do have craftivism sessions, and uh, where we th do crafts, simple crafts together, with the meaning. So we're thinking about how we can use those crafts to to make a point. For example, we made um, bees, knitted bees, uh, recently, or some people knitted bees, I didn't, but some people knitted bees, and the idea being to speak to the um, MPs about biodiversity and to ask them where that, that was on their political agenda. But we've done different things um, each, each session. Thank you. <clears throat> So we also meet every few months as well at, um, at Emmanuel House and we invite um, churches and the organisations in the city who we've been in contact with and ask them to just come and share what they're doing in the city so that we can also share about the work that we're doing. Thank you. So what next? As I just said before, a little bit, we're trying to find ways to grow as a community. Because what for me is really important is that we see our Friday gatherings being about much more than just meeting on a Friday and going home and forgetting until the next Friday. I want it to become something that is a part of who we are as we grow together, as, as, <coughs> as people of faith and not. And uh, so we're trying to explore what that might mean for us. And we're continuing to engage with the city to, to be involved in what's already going on. And uh, we want to raise our profile so that people know who we are. And uh, just really want to try and listen to what God is saying. So that we don't go off on our own way when God really wants us to go this way. So we're trying to do that as well. Thank you. So... This is exactly what I'm sure you all do as well. You want to love and serve the city as God does, and I'm sure that you want exactly the same thing. I could have been appointed to work in this circuit. I could have been appointed to work in the other Nottingham circuit. But it just so happens to put me in Nottingham North East. It doesn't really matter to some extent. But the thing is, with that, is to love and to serve the city just as God does. Thank you very much. I think that's the last one, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> so if you are interested in praying, you'd like to pray for us, or if you'd like to join us on Zoom on a Tuesday, you can do. But also we're trying to, I need, we were having the same that we could text prayers, but I need to change the, I'm about to, in the process of trying to change those up to WhatsApp prayers. If you want to join the WhatsApp group, uh, then please let me know after the service. Thank you. <clears throat> so our Bible reading for this morning is um, Isaiah 45 verse 3. And before we hear that reading, I want to just say to you that um, last week I was at a con Methodist conference in Birmingham. And it was um, a lot of business, but it was also, obviously, because that's what the intention is, but it's also very inspiring. And the particularly inspiring bits for me were hearing the addresses of uh, the President, Jill Newton, and the Vice President, Kerry Scarlett. But the President's address really spoke to me, and I found this in the past. And so often what I've done is I've actually used their address as my address the following Sunday. Because I think it's important that the people who call ourselves Methodists 
hear about what the president of conference is thinking. So, um, part, there are some tweaks I've missed some out of Jill's address and I've added it in some of my own illustrations, but basically my words that I'm going to speak are Jill's words. But before that, we hear the reading that she actually uh, and Scarlett, uh, Karen Scarlett, are using for the year. Thank you. Isaiah 45, verse 3. I will give you the treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. Amen. A pot of gold at the end of every rainbow. <clears throat> oh, that's the legend we've all grown up with, isn't it? But where does it come from? History tells us that Vikings invaded Ireland in the 8th century and were known for looting and then burying gold in places where they hoped it wouldn't be found. And when they left Ireland, they left some of their stolen gold behind and the legend began suggesting that Irish leprechauns found the gold and buried it again so that humans could never find it. And so the folklore suggests there is a pot of gold hidden where the rainbow touches earth. But of course we know that that's an illusion. I don't know whether you've ever tried to go to the end of a rainbow. But rainbows usually seem to move away as we move towards them. A reminder of how easy and tempting it can be to look for treasure in the wrong places. So where is our hidden treasure? Where is our treasure? Don't we share a desire deep within to find what is hidden? To uncover what is secret or to discover treasure? That's probably why children play hide and seek. And why many of us spend hours reading crime novels or who done this? I certainly do anyway. And why some wander along coastlines with metal detectors or travel the world geocaching? We'd love to get to the bottom of something, to solve the mystery, to bring into the light what is currently in the darkness. Each of us are of our own personal treasures. Those things we'd rescue from a burning home Photograph albums, keepsakes made by children or grandchildren, scrapbooks, holiday souvenirs. The list would look different for each of us and prove the truth of the saying that one person's rubbish is another person's treasure. There are apparently 77 verses in scripture that mention, tre mention treasure. 77 is a significant number in scripture, but I'm not going to go into that now. And some of those verses may be familiar. The parables in Matthew 13, where Jesus spoke of people giving up everything to acquire treasure, buried in a field, or a precious pearl, or the encouragement from Jesus to store up treasures in heaven, included in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6. And so Jill says, why in Isaiah 45 verse 3? I repeat the reading that says, I will give you the treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places, so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who will call you by your name. Well, let's begin to see how rich with meaning and full of God's promise that verse is. Could this really mean that God wants to open our eyes to things we would not otherwise see? And take hold of things that would otherwise remain hidden and unclaimed. It seems so. But know that the treasures are stored in darkness, and the riches are in hidden secret hidden in secret places. So that must mean that these treasures are all around us. God isn't trying to hide treasures from us. 
Instead, God is hiding them for us. I love that. God isn't trying to hide treasures from us. Instead, God is hiding them for us. And so what's the story behind these amazing words? Isaiah wrote this prophecy almost 200 years before King Cyrus was born. He foresaw King Cyrus invading Babylon, liberating the Jewish people from captivity, repatriating them to their homeland, just as history then unfolded. The prophet Daniel was amongst those Jewish exiles experiencing captivity, and while studying the prophecies of Jeremiah and Isaiah, he discovered the Jewish people had completed their 70 years in captivity, and that Isaiah predicted that King Cyrus would liberate them. So he took the scroll of Isaiah to Cyrus and showed him that long ago God had named him. Cyrus, a heathen king, was undoubtedly shocked, but this revelation gave him confidence to liberate the Jews, return them to Israel, and announce the rebuilding of Solomon's temple. But there was more. God promised that when Cyrus freed the Jewish people, he would give the treasures of darkness and wealth stored in secret places. And Jewish records confirm that when Cyrus declared the temple could be rebuilt, the soldiers in Babylon uncovered vast amounts of treasure that the king of Babylon had hidden under the Euphrates River. The Jewish people were in an extraordinarily difficult place. The temple had been destroyed. They'd been in exile for 70 years. Life as they'd, as they'd known it had been turned upside down. Destruction and darkness was now their lot. But amid this pain and anguish, treasure is discovered and life takes on a different perspective. God was at work using Cyrus's desire for earthly treasure to free his people. But doing that in such a way that Cyrus knew it was God who had called him by name. The terrain they had to navigate was challenging. And as we look around the world, this nation, our neighbours and the church, the terrain that we must navigate is also challenging. The world groans with war, famine, earthquake, faces a climate crisis. Our nation struggles to be a just and welcoming society in which all have enough. Our neighbours don't all have a sense of community and caring. And the church, fragile, declining, vulnerable, irrelevant. These are words that we hear used to describe us today. In her presidential address to the 2017 conference, the Reverend Lorraine Mellon quoted Kathleen Booth, who was the joint founder of the Salvation Army, as having said, if we are to better the future, we must disturb the present. Lorraine challenged us about how we were disturbing the present then, six years ago. Well, like it or not, and whether we were willing to allow it or not, the present is being disturbed for us by COVID, by the cost of living crisis, by the contracting Methodist membership, fewer available ministers, the list could continue. But the Jewish people found treasure in the darkness and riches in the <coughs> secret places. So if God is also hiding them from us, then there must be treasure to uncover today, even in the middle of all that is challenging, painful and dark around us. What might we seek, discover and see brought to birth in our own lives and in the life of the church? So what does treasure look like in our own personal lives? Last night I watched the film Indiana, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark and I'm hoping to go and see the new Indiana films. You probably film and you probably know that in these films, if you even haven't seen them, that the treasure it's usually, usually locked away, and the hunters, which is Indy and usually a sidekick, embark upon all kinds of adventures to discover what is hidden. And Indiana Jones faces many perils and risks, risks his life to find the treasure. 
that might be a bit extreme, but it's that kind of passion that we need for God if we're going to discover the treasure it has for us. Daniel chapter 2 tells the story of Nebuchadnezzar having dreams that no one could interpret. And Nebuchadnezzar therefore declared that all wise men in the land should be executed. But Daniel pleaded with the king for more time and urged his friends to pray. And that night, in the darkness of his, darkness of his, darkness of his dreams, excuse me, Daniel received the interpretation that the king longed for. In those challenging times, Daniel was given the treasure to, needed to secure a different future for him and for others. So both he and Cyrus found treasure whilst in difficult and dark places. And that can be our, our experience too. In those unwanted places of suffering, those helpless dark places where, when God is the one we cry out to, the discovery of treasure may be just a moment away. I'm reading a book at the moment, this is my illustration, called The Hiding Place. And it's a book that I read many, 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 30 years ago probably. And um, I use Audible, I listen to a lot of books, and I found that book on Audible and I thought, yeah, I'd like to hear that again. And it's a book about uh, some Christians in Holland who hide during the war, Second World War, who hide uh, some Jews in their house. And in the end, they didn't, they didn't find the Jews, but they, they knew that the people, this lady called Corrie Ten Boom who wrote the book, and it's about her and her family. Um, the, the authorities found out about them and they were taken away and imprisoned and went to Auschwitz. Auschwitz, it's about their story. But I was just thinking about what treasures those people were, what wonderful treasures they were, and how, how precious they were to Corrie and her family to think that they would be able to, should, should and would be able to put them somewhere in their home where nobody could find them and keep them safe. How precious they were. You know, even during frustration and pain and anger or disappointment, times of difficulty, God has treasure to reveal if we reach out to him, if we seek him, if we dig deep into him. The treasures of faith, perseverance, patience, empathy and trust are all there to discover because God is working, even in the darkness. And of course, God's word, the Bible, is treasure itself. At the point I'm up to in this book at the moment, Corrie is in a prison and she uh, managed to get hold of some Gospels, um, but she gave them all away. And she just given them away, away. somebody has just given her a Bible, which is on a piece of string that she puts down the back of a blouse so that nobody can see it. Because for her, the Bible is real treasure. And when we spend time quietly reading and meditating upon it, we store up treasure for the future and discover re secret, secret riches as we draw closer to God. We also discover that we are a treasure to God, that he cherishes and values us. We are precious to him. And Jill said, that a deacon, I don't know who it was, um, said this quote, a treasure that has stayed with me all my life was an opportunity for half an hour's quiet time early morning. What a difference it could make if every Methodist was sharing that regular commitment to discover the treasures that God has hidden in his word. Digging for treasure does take effort and time, but the rewards are amazing. Being rooted in God's word being able to draw on its riches and treasures when days are dark. As perhaps I feel too many within the church now will give, we'll give fresh hope and confidence as we discern how God wants us to be his disciples in this church in this time. It's very easy to feel abandoned by God, but all the time God is working in the darkness, in those secret places, Bringing things to birth. Remember that the greatest thing that God ever did, bringing Jesus back to life, was done in the dark, in the cold of the tomb. 
So what does treasure look like in the church? So we've thought about how and where we might find treasures in life. But what, what about us as the body of Christ, as the church? What and where are the hidden treasures that God yeah. is hiding for us? I want us to consider that there may be treasure within, within the church that we've not discovered. Unseen things happening that need to be nurtured. Searching for treasure takes hard work, dedication and patience. Birth is a strong narrative thread throughout the scripture. From the whole creation brought, being brought to birth in Genesis, to Christ yielding to the process of human birth. And then speaking to Nicodemus about the need to be born again. These and many others, stories in scripture, highlighted the importance of the birthing process, but also acknowledged both the joy and the pain associated <coughs> with it. When we think about embryos forming in the womb, it happens in the darkness, hidden from the eye. And even though what's happening becomes apparent to the one carrying the embryo at an early stage, no one else knows what is happening in that secret hidden place. This is me again. I have a friend called Karen who is a midwife, and she's currently in India teaching nurses, teaching nurses to become midwives. She's an absolutely amazing woman, absolutely wonderful. She's kind, but she's straight speaking. And I would imagine that she's making a real difference. And she helps the nurses improve the service, service, service that they offer to those who are pregnant. The midwife's role is to notice what is happening throughout the pregnancy, and most critically at the birth. They're intimately involved in the birth process and require qualities such as being patient, encouraging, supportive, unobtrusive and trustworthy. Not least when the outcome of the process is not as expected. These are all qualities found in God and in his dealings with us. And yes, some of us have these same qualities. Some of these same qualities are found in treasure seekers too. So as God displays the qualities of, the qualities of a midwife, and we are made in the image of God, perhaps we are also being called to be midwives. Where in the church are we pregnant with potential? What treasure is God hiding for us that we are being called to discover and bring into sight? So if the church is to re reproduce, then midwives are necessary, reading the signs that bring to birth what is germinating in the darkness, uncovering the treasure, remembering that God is hiding it for us, not from us. Our calling is to notice and to uncover with the help of the Spirit. So is this possible? Can we find treasure amid all the sufferings in the world? amidst this fragility, pain and anxiety in the church. The author Tom Wright says the, birth, the picture of birth pangs has been used for sanctuaries by Jews as they reflected on the way in which, as they believed, their God was intending to bring to birth his new world, his new creation, the age to come in which justice and peace, mercy and truth would at last for a flourish. So when it feels as everything is falling apart in the church and we're in pain, could God actually be putting us back together? Is it death we're experiencing or new life? What might God be revealing in these challenging times? If like me you believe it's possible that the church is pregnant with potential, that God is doing something in the darkness, that there is treasure to be unearthed. What might be expected of us in this process of bringing new things to birth, of being the midwives? In the church, we're very good at setting agendas, at developing programs, but not also not so good at listening, noticing, and then responding to what the Spirit of God is doing. Pain that we're experiencing within the church now might be the very sign 
that something new is emerging. The treasure that God has hidden for us is waiting to be discovered and used, not hidden away in the museum or in a cabinet, or only to be used on special occasions, or buried again for others to find. But as we open our eyes and attune our ears to be more alert to where God is placing treasure in the darkness, let us never forget that we ourselves are God's treasure. Scripture reminds us that we are God's chosen treasure, that he has called us out of the darkness into the light. And that means that others we encounter in our communities are also a treasure too. As his treasure, God longs for us to discover the treasure that he has hidden for us, not from us, even when life is hard, painful and confusing. No, there isn't treasure at the end of the rainbow, but maybe the rainbow itself is the treasure that reminds to, that, that reminds to us <coughs> of God's continuing faithfulness. So may we be a church that traces the rainbow through the rain, discovers the treasure in the darkness, and fulfills the expectant potential that God has placed within us, his people. Amen. That was a slightly condensed version of Jill's words and with some editing and with a few of my illustrations but, illustrations, but please, if you get a chance, have a look at it online because it's so inspirational and the theme, Hidden Treasure, is a wonderful one, I think, for the President and Vice President had to have for the year. And so we continue our worship as we sing together number 462. Come with me, come wonder. Yeah. 
by David Nash, who will lead us in our prayers and intercession. Thank you. Uh, before I start, I just want to share something with you. A few years ago, when my, my, my youngest girl was a little we shared a space on that blanket there was Adrian Charles, just fresh off the BBC at lunchtime, right, with his family and his little girl. We sat there, get to the end of the day, and we're all packing up our stuff. He's packing up his stuff. His girl had been digging all day long, digging holes, filling them in, digging holes, filling them in. Comes to the end of the day, they're looking around. His wife says, have you seen my shoes? <laughs> <laughs> just want to share that with you. It just came to mind when Judith was talking earlier. Uh, prayers and intercession. Lord, we come in prayer not just because we can, but because Jesus taught us that you love as a parent. And like that parent, want only what is right for us. Help us as we try and focus on the big issues of the day about which we often feel so powerless and where the treasure seems to be very deeply hidden and the small daily concerns that sometimes threaten to overwhelm us. There's a response. Lord, in your mercy, you could re uh, respond with, hear our prayer. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our world today, a world filled with wonderful treasures which often seem to be hidden from sight. We pray for the people of Paris affected by the riots and particularly for the family and friends of Nahel M, the 17-year-old who was killed. We continue to pray for the people of Ukraine whose struggle appears to have no end, and for those whose lives have been forever changed following the loss of many people they have loved, either through death or because they have left the country to try and find peace elsewhere. Give us the wisdom to understand more about the root causes of conflicts and how they might best be resolved without further mistrust. So we pray for the world's leaders that they may be given insight and strength to continually strive for just societies in all regions of the world. Lord, in your mercy. As schools and colleges prepare to close later this month, we pray for our children and young people at the end of another academic year. May young lives find refreshments and relaxation with friends and families. Be with those who will begin to have concerns about exam results and those starting new lives in the world of work or academia. Especially, Lord, be with those who feel let down or alienated by all things educational and don't know where to turn. Help us to create a society where both young and old, gifted and less able, feel valued and proud to be a part and recognise the amazing treasure that they are. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. We think now of those in need in our own community, the elderly, the housebound, and those in care homes, hospitals and hospices. We remember the victims of violence, not forgetting, forgetting our own city of Nottingham, where lives have been lost <coughs> to violence in recent weeks. And so we pray for all those who minister to so many different needs, both from, within, both from within the family, the churches, and from the other professional and voluntary services, and who, in different ways, are able to reveal the treasure that is often so deeply hidden in people's lives. 
Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray for those who face the pain of grief at the loss of a loved one. Help us to support all those who mourn, both with our prayers and with practical help, both this day and in the days and weeks to come. I remember those who are living with health issues and other worries that are robbing them of the treasure that is life in all its fullness. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. loving God, you have treasure that is hidden for us and not from us. Help us to hold on to the facts that nothing in this world can separate us from the love of Jesus. We offer these prayers in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. So before we sing together our closing hymn, I just want to remind you what I was saying before. If you would like to go on the prayer list or for um, the work that we're doing in the city centre, or you would like to um, hear more about what we're doing, if you'd like to receive the newsletter, uh, or you might be interested in getting involved in some way, perhaps you're a crafty person, you'd like to get involved in craftivism. But if you just want to have a chat with me afterwards, that would be great. Or I can give you my number and you can give me a call or email me later on. And so we close by singing together uh, the hymn, Your Hand, O God, Has Guided, Your Flock from Age to Age. The wonderful tale is written full clear on every page. Number 692. Please stand.
And so, Lord, we offer you these gifts of money and pray that every single penny will be used wisely to further the work of your kingdom. Amen. Amen. So we bless one another by, by saying the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all, and